Okay, well, let's get started. Uh, welcome to the seventh UQM virtual seminar. Um, uh, today, we are very happy to have Yahui Zhang and Zhen Bi uh, to speak about their uh, latest research. And uh, as a first speaker, we have uh, Yahui Zhang uh, from Harvard. Uh, he's going to tell us about a new way of killing a Fermi surface. Yahui, take it away. Okay. So, hello everyone. Thanks for coming and thanks for the opportunity to speak here. So, so in this talk, I will talk about our recent work. Uh, so, about this paper I wrote together with Subir Sashdiv. So, the problem we wanted to discuss is actually a very, very old problem. So. It's about uh, how we can destroy a Fermi liquid. So I guess everyone knows that uh, there is a Latinger constraint if we have a spinful problem with spin, spin rotation symmetry. So the Latinger constraint says that the Fermi surface volume must be the n over two, here n is the total density. Because there are two spins, so we need to divide two by two here. But in the experiments, so usually we find a case like uh, showing in this plot, so we found that when we choose some parameter like doping or pressure or magnetic field, this larger inside of the Fermi liquid gets destroyed to be a smaller Fermi surface. So usually the current density in large Fermi surface is one plus x, but in the smaller Fermi surface side, the current density is only x. And usually when you have this situation, it seems there is some intermediate regime which which is sandwiched by the small Fermi surface and large Fermi surface. And this regime is usually a no Fermi liquid. So the typical experimental feature is that there is a linear T resistivity. So from this experimental data, people have conjecture that this no Fermi liquid or stretch matter is actually associated with this transition. So generically, this transition is a matter matter transition. But for special case, with where x is equal to zero. This is a meta insulated transition. So people have studied this kind of problem for several decades. I think uh, there are two general classes of uh, theories. So the first one is just uh, the familiar Landau symmetry breaking theory, which says that uh, we start from the Fermi liquid. There is a symmetry breaking order which re reconstructs the Fermi surface. And at the critical point, this Fermi surface just covers to the critical boson. So the famous example is just the Hertz-Milli theory for antiferromagnetic critical point. So for this kind of theory, we have a well-defined Lagrangian. So the analysis of the Lagrangian is still not trivial in 2 plus 1D, but we can make some progress. But there are some experiments which suggest that the Landau symmetry breaking is not enough. And uh, some people started to think there may be a different class of theory for this kind of transition. And this theory does not involve symmetry breaking. Instead, it involves some more exotic decombined degree of freedom. But in many cases, except some special case, we actually don't know the, the theory. So we conjecture there is a theory. But we don't know what it looks like. So let me show you some examples so why we want this exotic theory? Why Landau symmetry breaking is not enough? So the first example is in cuprate. So we know when we hold dope the multi insulator in cuprate, we first get a pseudo gap phase. And then when we increase the doping further, we get the Fermi liquid. And in the middle, there is a stretch matter. So the, from, the, from the last decade, so people also do some hall measurement and the high magnetic field, which suppresses the superconductor. They found that uh, at a larger doping, so the whole number is one plus P. This is uh, in agreement with the Latinger constraint. But below some critical doping, it seems that we only have a smaller Fermi surface. But in incorporate, so at least uh, at, a at a high temperature and uh, zero magnetic field, we don't find evidence for long range density wave orders. So th this, mm -hmm. This suggests that the Landau symmetry breaking cannot work for this kind of evolution. So we need some more exotic theory. Another famous example is the heavy Fermi system in three dimension. 
So when you show some pressure on high magnetic field, you find uh, on one side you find a heavy Fermi liquid, which has a large Fermi surface. But in the other side, here you find a smaller Fermi surface, which coexists with the order. So of course here you may seek this must be a first minute theory of anti-parameter critical point, because here it's a small firm surface with new order. However, you know, in three, di three dimensions, first minute theory is under control. So you have some predictions, but the predictions do not agree with the experiments. So the first in experiments, people find some linear T resistivity here, which cannot be explained by first minute theory. Also, in many experiments, people find the current density actually drops across this uh, critical point. This is also very hard to imagine in a long dot symmetry brink framework. So, in the last several decades, people think uh, about other more exotic possibilities. So, the famous concept is it is actually associated with counter brinking dot tradition. So, the idea is that uh, some electrons just got uh, more localized, and the magnetic order is developed only at a lower scale. So this, this concept has been proposed for a long time, but the difficulty is we don't have a good theory for this concept, counter bringing that. So, so it's very hard to make the charge gap and the magnetic order happen simultaneously. Yeah, so we just don't know what the final theory looks like, but it's quite clear that it's not a long dot simple brinking. So, then we wanted to get some inspirations from some existing examples we know, which is beyond the Landau symmetry break. So one famous example is the decompound critical point between the order and the VBS order. So in this classical example, so people found that the near order can be described by a Higgs phase, and the VBS order can be described by a confound phase of a gauge theory. And now we can have a decombined critical point which separates the Higgs phase and confinement phase. So the question we want to ask is, can this DQCP framework be generalized to metamatic tradition? Yeah, and of course people have studied this problem, you know, falling in this direction. So one famous approach is just a slave boson theory. So you run to C equal to BF, so there is a U1 gauge field and the Fermi liquid sign is usually viewed as the Higgs phase. So we condense B, then you just get the Fermi liquid. So ideally, we want the, the other side to be combined and we get a smaller Fermi surface. But here the problem is that uh, this U1 gauge field will cover to a spinner Fermi surface. And we know this space is not combined. So this theory predicts an uh, interesting transition between Fermi liquid and the uh, FR star phase. But in this smaller Fermi surface side, we have a ghost Fermi surface, we have a spinner Fermi surface. So this is a quite a successful theory, but uh, it does not uh, apply to the experiments we are interested in. In both Cooperate and uh, Heavy Fermi, we believe there is no spinner Fermi surface in the smaller Fermi surface side. So apparently, we, for these two systems, we need to go beyond this slave boson theory. We need to have another framework. So in this talk, I will pre propose an, another approach. So what is new about this approach? So in this new approach, we will reverse the order. We will view the Fermi liquid phase as a combined phase, and the smaller Fermi surface side as a Higgs phase. So it's opposite to this. And it turns out this perspective can be quite helpful. So first, let me explain why, how, how I got this idea. Yeah, so I will start from a very specific example, the pseudo gap matter in a whole doped cuprate. So this is a typical phase diagram. So at the over doped region, so if you do RPS, you just see a large whole pocket centering at the pi pi. And when you decrease the doping, you enter this pseudo gap phase. And here, when you do RPS, you only see some Fermi arc. So this is quite strange. So here, I will propose, a, uh, not a propose, so, so it's basically some very simple idea about the Fermi arc. So this idea is that uh, it's actually not arc, it's actually a whole pocket. So we, we see the arc because the spectral weight on the bank side is very small. So this is really an assumption. It has never been verified by experiment. 
So we want this assumption because, you know, a closed firm surface is easier to analyze. So our come to the point of why the spectral weight on the bank side is small. But for now, let's just assume this. With this assumption, we still need to understand the following question. So how does this pseudo so gap evolve to the Fermi liquid in the overdoped regime? So here, I just drawn some plots. So here, in the pseudo gap, I just assume there are four hole pockets. And for each hole pocket, I have a bright side and a dark side. So for some reason, this dark side has a very small spectral weight and cannot be seen by RPS. So now I want to understand the evolution. So I increase the whole doping. So of course, these four whole pockets must increase their volume. So as you can imagine, at some point, they were drawn together. And then this brown side, they were drawn together to form the large firm surface. As we know, in the larger doping regime, so we will only have this large firm surface. So one possible evolution, one possible scenario is that this dark side, so this this dense line, they just appear, they just disappear. So this is one way I can imagine to connect the pseudo gap to the firm liquid. So when, when I draw these plots, I actually got shocked. So the reason is the following, because if we reverse this order, if we start from the firm liquid, we follow these plots, it means from the firm liquid, we should end something to get to the pseudo gap. This is actually opposite to the way I usually and people usually think. So I have thought about the pseudo gap matter for several years. And usually I just follow some pattern theory. And in this pattern theory, when we start from firm liquid, we always remove something. We never try to end something. So yeah, so from this plant, I start to think maybe I should change the view and I should end something. But clear, clearly, so the Euro pattern framework cannot work. So it does not support you to add something to the electron. So as a result, here I will propose a new kind of pattern theory, which allows us to add something to the Fermi liquid. So let me explain the detail. So, so, so the theory works as the following. So we, we get this intuition that we need some, some other fermions to form this density line. So the idea is we just add this oxalate auxiliary degree of freedom. So in this case, I will add two copies of Fermi, F1 and F2. I will explain why we need two copies of Fermi. And because of this, we will have a very enlarged Herbert space. So we will have C is just the electron and F1 and F2. F1 and F2 are the auxiliary fermions. But we don't want, want it to work in this enlarged Herbert space. We don't want to change our problem. So how do we recover the, the physical hyperspace? So the idea is that we need to add a constraint. The constraint is that the F1 and F2, these auxiliary fermions, they just form a trivial product states. So this trivial product state, I just say it's, it's S here. So once you add this constraint, you will recover the physical hyperspace because F1 and F2, they just form a trivial product state and they disappear. So here, I choose the trivial product state to be a product of all such singlet. So this is the reason why we need two copies of Fermi's. Because otherwise, you cannot have a trivial product state. OK, so with this constraint, we can recover the Herbert space. But uh, when we formulate the theory in the mean field level, we can work in this enlarged Herbert space. We will only add the constraint later. So this is kind of the same philosophy people are working, people work on spin liquid. So first we can round down a mean field wave function, which is formed by say F1 and F2. So because it's mean field, so the wave function is just some kind of slater determinant, which I will specify later. And then we add this constraint. The constraint here is just saying F1 and F2 must form this trivial product state. And then we get a wave function. And this wave function lives purely in the physical Herbert space. I will show you a mean field ansatz later, and I will argue that it can describe the pseudo gap matter. So ideally, we can just use this variational wave function 
to do some numerical studies, but we, we really wanted to do some analytical studies. And uh, in the analytical studies, to, to respect this constraint, usually we just uh, introduce some gauge field. So what is the constraint? So the constraint is that uh, this F1 and F2, they must form all sound singlet. So it turns out this is equivalent to the following three constraints. So the first one is, so the density of F1 must be one. The second one is the density of F2 must be one. And the third is the spin. The total spin of F1 and F2, they must be zero. So this is, they form a singlet. So from the first constraint, we get a U1 gauge field. From the second one, we get a, another U1 gauge field. I will call them U11 and U12. And from the third one, we get a SU2 gauge field. So this SU2 gauge field just says the index, spin index carried by F1 and F2 can be freely rotated because they form a singlet. When we rotate the spin, it doesn't do anything. So this is so, so the total gauge field we have is just U1 cross U1 cross SU2. Um, but strictly speaking, the real gauge structure is even larger because here we have one electron per set. So you can also view it as one hole per set. You can do some rotation between electron and hole. So, so actually this U1 one will be larger to SU2 one. So yeah, for people who are familiar with spin liquid, this may be obvious. If you are not familiar, that's fine. So in this talk, we will just assume the gauge field is only U1, U1, SU2. So this is rotation between particle and the hole are not important. So there is actually another way to get these gauge fields. So, so before I, I say this F1 and F2, just the auxiliary fermions, and we, we have this hard constraint. So the other way is we don't have view it as a hard constraint, we view it as an energetic constraint. So basically we can introduce F1 and F2 as physical degree of freedom. So we have a new Hamiltonian, which have three layers. So in the first layer, it is a TG mode or Hubbard mode we are interested. But we have another two layers. At each layer, we have a spin wall hub and each set. So and these two layers can cover together by some J2. So the important thing is when we take J2 to infinity, we can recover the Hubbard model from these two layers, they will form singlet and they disappear. But from synchronicity or from, from theoretical, to make the theory easy, you, you wanted to soften the constraint and assume these hidden layers are not dead completely. So we will take the J2 infinity limit only later. And from this, you can also get the gauge field very easily. So first, you can represent these two, the spin or half of these two layers with the standard Fermi operators. From this, you can get a two SU2 gauge field. So naively, you think we can just use F1 and F2 to formulate our theory, but this is not correct. Because you can imagine, you can have a spin from surface from F1 and F2, then the spin carried by F1 and F2 are gapless. But in reality, we really wanted to take the J2 to infinity limit. And in this limit, the spin in these two layers, they cannot be gapped. They must be gapped. So we need to gap out the spin. So how do we gap out the spin? So you can imagine the large J2 limit is like a multi-gap in spin channel. So to gap out the spin, we just introduce some slave spin, just like we introduce slave boson and form charge mode instead. So this is level spin is just a SU2 matrix. And because of this, we will also introduce a SU2 gauge field. So the physical meaning is just the spin index carried by F1 and F2, they are not physical, they are dark. They can be the spin rotation for F1 and F2 are gauge symmetry. So with this gauge field, we can now introduce our mean field ansatz. So the ansatz look like this. So we will cover C and F1 together and leave the F2 independently. So for C and F1, I will introduce this phi term. So this phi term says C and F1, they can hybridize together to form a one single band. And because F1 has a density one, C has the density one plus X. So the total density is two plus X. 
but the two plus x is equal to x because this is a simple problem. So we can have a small whole pocket. And because of this far term, it turns out uh, this gate field will be fixed. Most importantly, this spin rotation gate field will be fixed. So after this uh, condensation of this phi, the spin index carried by F1 and F2, they are, not, they are now physical spin index. This means F2 cannot be identified as spinner. So it is still neutral, but it's spinner now. So we can have a mean field answer for this spinner. So the famous example is just the U1 Dirac spin leak. So in total, the third gap is described by this plot. So C and F1, they will form a whole pockets. And F2 can be viewed as spinner. And it just forms some U1 Dirac spin leak. And this spin leak part just decoupled from the whole pocket part. So this state has been proposed before as a Fermi liquid star. But I believe this is the first time that we can describe this state in pure mean field level. And more importantly, we can actually naturally explain the Fermi arc. So the reason is, you know, from this, from C and F1, we can get four whole pockets, which is shown in the first row. So when you add this five, you will get four whole pockets. So the red line is mainly dominated by C, and this blue line is mainly dominated by F1. The important thing is in our past, you only see C dagger C. You don't see this dark side because it's from auxiliary firm, so you don't see it. So the second row is really the r spectral function for C dagger C, and you can clearly see a Fermi arc. Okay, so what, 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 we have, what, have, uh, what have we achieved is the following. So we can, we have a gauge theory and we can describe the, the third gap phase and the Higgs phase. So this phi, now there are five or Higgs the gauge field and we get the third gap phase. So how do you get the Fermi liquid phase? That's very easy. So we just combine F1 and F2, then they just disappear. So we get the Fermi liquid. So then the, Next important question is, so how do we connect the Higgs phase to combined phase? So in the famous near order to VBS transition, we know we can have a single transition between Higgs phase and combined phase. But in this example, it's not clear. So I think, uh, at least now, I don't know the fate of the critical region. So there may be a direct phase transition, but there may also be intermediate phase. And the third possibility is that the, even the critical point is not as stable. So the critical point may be covered by some other symmetric linking, like a superconductor dough. So the good, good news is that at least now we have a Lagrangian. And we can try to understand the RG flow of this Lagrangian and decide which fit the theory will finally choose. So this is a very hard problem, but there may be some hope. So, so here I just describe a theory for, for the corporate, but uh, the same theory can be easily generalized to any hybrid model. So as you can imagine, if you have a hybrid model or any lattice, you can do two parameters. One is a doki, one is tier value. Maybe you can imagine this kind of phase diagram. So when you, when you increase the U, you will enter a pseudo gap phase. So in our, in our Theory, the third gap phase will have two decoupled parts. So the one part is just the spin part. So it, it is a spin liquid, all manual order. The other part is some smaller whole pockets. In this theory, the mount insulator is actually uh, some special case of the third gap. So in this third gap, you have these smaller whole pockets. But when you decrease the doping, you will naturally get the mount insulator. So in this, in the corporate example, so the mount insulator on the pseudo gap I described has a spin liquid, and you can easily make it has, have a magnetic order. You just make F1 and F2 have magnetic order. That's quite easy. And the same theory can be generalized to any SU hybrid mode. So it's not a specific to SU2 or spin or hub. So here, it's a summary. So in this talk, I propose a new partner theory using auxiliary degree of Fermi. 
So this is very different from the familiar pattern theory we usually use. And with this theory, we can describe the smaller Fermi surface phase as a Higgs phase, and the Fermi liquid as a confined phase. As an application, so incorporate with this theory, we have a FL stack phase for the pseudo gap matter, and within our theory, the Fermi arc can be naturally explained. So the future work is what is a critical theory? How can we connect the Higgs phase to the confined phase? That's something I want to study in future. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Yahui. Uh, okay, we have time for a few questions. Ask something. Um, Could you speak up a little bit? Yeah, so can I ask a quick question? Yeah, sure. Um, so why did you prefer to put the F2 in a gapless spin liquid? Oh, there is no reason. I mean, you have a freedom to choose your favorite spin liquid. But I think for square lattice, uh, I mean, Dirac spin liquid is the most natural one. Yeah, no, the, the phenomenologically, if you have a gapless spin liquid, it will show up in, say, spin correlations. Uh, I'm not sure it is measurable, uh, but, 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 but anyway, this is just an illustration, you know, we can easily get out of it to have a Z2 spin liquid or something. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah. Uh, the spin-spin correlation, com the contribution of the spin-spin correlation coming from the spin on should be measurable. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. But I think, uh, you know, there is some some hall result in corporate in, in solar gap region. I mean, if you imagine F2, is, uh, you want to spin it. So maybe this some hall can be naturally explained. Uh, maybe, yeah. Yeah, but anyway, I don't think this part is so essential. I mean, we, can, right. we have freedom to change this part to fit the experiments. Mm -hmm. Okay, good, thank you. Uh, okay, I have also a question related to this uh, Hamiltonian, uh, the degree of freedom, like you said, in terms of the choice of the Hamiltonian for F2. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, do you get any, like, a non-trivial metal if you change this, let's say, to a, a churn insulator or something? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, so if F2 form a current spin liquid, for example, uh -huh. uh, so you will have a meter, so this meter, so, if, so the charge part is really like a Fermi liquid, except that the current density is small. But you can have a very large Sommerhall conductivity, which is from the current spin liquid part. I see. So basically these two parts, they really decouple in this theory. Okay. I have a question. Yeah, please. Um, so the, if, if the F1 and F2 were actual other bands of the system, like in, like in a charge transfer insulator, there's some other degrees of freedom that matter. Um, everything would be the same, except your prediction for the um, uh, Fermi arcs would, would go away. Is that right? Because then you could see the back half of the arc if it were real. Yeah, yeah. So I think the, the, the question of this Fermi arc is actually a quantitative question, right? So count here I, I cover the so in this answers I cover the Z and F1. So strictly speaking, F1 will have a no zero spectral weight, which means you know this bank side the spectral weight in this bank side is not a zero, strictly speaking. But just in this case it's very small. You cannot see it in experiments. Okay, but my, my question was, how would the story be different if instead of, uh, how to say, um, uh, gauging away F1 and F2, yeah. there were just actual other other bands in the hub? You mean like some heavy Fermi problem? 
Well, I mean, just just do everything you did, except except don't gauge the this SU two symmetry. Oh, and you're just add, you would just be adding degrees of freedom. Yeah. So the for the so the gap phase, it may be quite similar. But yeah, I think it. Uh, yeah, but usually, you know, in heavy frame system, we only add one band. So there is no spinner part. But if you have two, two, two copies of spin, and if you couple them together, maybe you will get this base. You will get the same base as the one I described here. But I guess the electrons in the other bands would still couple to the photon, right? Yeah, that's true. OK, I see. Thank you. I mean, I think in heavy Fermi system, you know, once you allow any other degree freedom, it's very trivial to get a smaller frame surface. I think what I, I wanted to do is, you know, I really wanted to study the single band problem. I don't want to really to introduce the other degree freedom. This is still the same problem as a single band hybrid mode. All right, so we have time for one more quick question, if there is any. All right, thank you so much, Yahui. Yeah, thank you. So uh, we're going to move on to the next talk. Um,